Okay, let's make a let's make a start. Um, I think you know it, it's 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 just after one, so a very very good time to begin. Um, I'd like to welcome you all very much to uh, the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities, Torch, uh, wonderful acronym. And um, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Tom Smith to introduce the panel and to and to chair the discussion. Um, just to introduce myself as Torch Director, um, my name is Elika Burma and um, I'm very, very happy to, uh, to look after Torch um, in these um, interesting years in which we are investigating humanities and science, humanities and language and translation, and also humanities and, and diversity. So you're all very welcome, I hope. Um, that you will all um, feel interested in participating in the discussion when we open for, for questions later. Um, so I'd now like to introduce our chair for the day, um, who is going to uh, introduce the panel looking at um, Karen Leader's edited, um, very, very interesting um, uh, re-reading East Germany, looking at both film and literature. Tom is stipendiary lecturer in German at Worcester College, and he researches in very appropriately, uh, given the book, um, in 20th and 21st century literature and also film. Um, he's also interested in gender and queer studies, critical theory, and politics in poetry and prose. So I can't think of a more appropriate chair for today. Tom, you're very Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to be invited to um, chair this event, partly, I think, because this volume has been quite eagerly anticipated among those of us who work on GDR culture. Uh, my um, doctoral research, um, which I've just completed, has been on, um, on masculinity in the GDR, and it's been, uh, it's been, a, real, um, it's been a real pleasure um, this year to uh, get my hands on a copy of this book and, um, and read um, such excellent contributions from um, leading um, academics in the field. Um, it's a, a pleasure personally also because I actually happened to miss the conference which uh, Karen Leader organized in 2011, um, which started the contributors' work on the volume we're going to be discussing, rereading East Germany. Um, so it's wonderful to be able to um, see the, uh, the finished product of the ongoing discussions since then and to see how this volume really has positioned itself at the forefront of current research into the GDR. <laughs> Um, Rereading East Germany, I've actually um, forgotten my copy, but if maybe one of the panel would uh, maybe one of the panel would uh, would hold up one of theirs. Um, it combines twelve articles, um, all by leading researchers in the field, um, some of whom have been writing about the GDR since long before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I'm told the volume's reviewers uh, described it as a dream team, and it's it's rather hard to disagree. I think contributors come from three continents; they're all extremely influential in their fields. Um, and uh, not all are academics. The volume also includes a prominent contemporary writer, Hoga Teschke, um, who surveys the GDR's theatre scene. Um, <laughs> Rereading East Germany was published at the end of last year, um, which was 25 years after East and West Germany were formally unified on 3rd of October 1990. And in many senses, I think the intervening two and a half decades have seen a substantial rereading, but also rewriting and re researching of experiences in the GDR, its history, and its cultural products. Um, I was asked to share my thoughts on the volume, and I'll be very brief, because I know that's not why you're all here. Um, but as I see it, this volume does a number of uh, a number of very important things. So first, it looks back at the GDR, asking how the state and its culture can be better understood from the perspective of the present. Um, it also looks into the more recent past at changes in approaches to the GDR since 1990, and at the changes and continuities in writings and films by East Germans after that historical caesura. Um, as the dust jacket on the book rightly says, it's the first volume to do so in English, and indeed its broad and nuanced approaches range more widely than anything I've managed to find in German on the subject recently either. Um, I think, the, um, I think secondly, uh, the volume very usefully takes stock of the current position of scholarship on the GDR, which is, I think, an important task in a field that attracts substantial and I think growing interest, particularly in the UK, among researchers. 
Um, throughout the volume runs the question which so often hounds those of us who work on GDR culture. Um, how can GDR scholarship make an important contribution not only to historical research but to contemporary discussions and debates, which is something that I hope um, the, we will uh, get a chance to discuss. And so um, third, I think it's therefore important to emphasize that this volume is not just a rereading, but a rereading. So in other words, for all it's looking back across the GDR, the individual essays all make essential contributions, I think, to research that's very much ongoing, and as the panelists will discuss further, to the teaching of the period. For me, as an early career researcher, the volume opens up the complexities of GDR culture and demonstrates how productive it can be to keep engaging with this material. And in fact, reading the articles one after the other, I was struck by how similar many of the trends are across the different genres, poetry, drama, prose, life writing, film, and so on. These articles make a concerted case, I think, for the need to take these cultural products seriously, not just because of their engagement with politics, censorship, and utopia, but also because of their literary and aesthetic contribution to uh, European culture in the 20th century. And decades of debates have created oppositions um, through which to view GDR culture, politics and aesthetics, intellectuals and ordinary people, victims and perpetrators, complicity and resistance, the list goes on. I think 25 years on, this volume shows how we're now in a position to view East Germany and its culture with fresh eyes, historicizing and moving beyond these restrictive oppositions by drawing on interdisciplinary, comparative and contemporary theoretical approaches. Um, I just wanted to give one example from the volume which I think um, illustrates this. So um, Stephen Brockman, who um, uh, is, is not with us um, today, but uh, one of his, um, uh, is one of the contributors to the volume, has been very influential in rehabilitating scholarship on the literature of the early GDR. And his article in the volume called The Emergence of GDR Culture situates the debates around socialist realism, not just in the context of the literature of the period, but also the music. Uh, with Hans Eisler's Faust opera, for example, and the country's, uh, the country's famous national anthem. And this approach, I think, comparing different artistic media is picked up in several of the other chapters that follow, uh, that follow Brockman's. And it seems to me that GDR studies can make a really valuable contribution to discussions across the humanities about how artistic forms relate to each other and to the societies which produce them. And so to finish, I thought I'd point on a couple of directions that I think this volume points for, um, for um, discussions in the future, which hopefully we can discuss further later. <laughs> First, and actually this came up just now over sandwiches, a number of the articles pick up on the GDR's different intellectual generations and this generational model of GDR scholarship, which has been very influential and indeed in 20th century um, German studies in general. And I wonder actually whether by showing the complexity within this model and the, the various different ways it can be used, often, um, often, very, um, often raising very interesting um, uh, problems and, and issues, I wonder whether this volume gestures to a move away from this sort of analysis and towards something um, that, um, uh, something that accounts for the simultaneity and the mutual influence between um, these various layers of, um, of, historical, um, uh, of historical periods and of chronology. Um, I also think the volume focuses largely, of course, on the cultural output of the GDR itself, but it seems to me that contemporary literature itself is finding ways of rereading uh, GDR culture to critique the contemporary world. Um, and um, I can see that there's, um, there's increasing, um, increasing latitude for, um, for more work in this area. Authors such as Antje Ravitch Strube and Ulrike Amut Zandich might be interesting starting points. In any case, I'm looking forward to uh, this afternoon's discussion a great deal, so I won't take up any more time. Um, and I'll instead hand over to our, um, to our panel of guests, um, who have all made outstanding contributions to the study of the GDR, and will no doubt have some fascinating insights. So um, it's uh, with great pleasure that I welcome Dennis Tate as the first of our panel today. Uh, professor Tate is Emeritus Professor of German Studies at the University of Bath and over the course of his career has been extremely influential in making GDR studies in the UK what they are today. His publications on the topic are too many to list but include his 1984 monograph The East German Novel and since reunification a monograph on the author Franz Fuhmann in 1995. His 2007 volume, Shifting Perspectives, East German Autobiographical Narratives Before and After the End of the GDR, remains one of the most influential contributions to the study of the GDR since 1990, tracing the importance of life writing for GDR literature more broadly and locating important trends and continuities that shape even post-reunification writing by authors from the GDR. 
Uh, he's played a central role since reunification in encouraging engagement with the GDR and its influence on contemporary German culture, co-editing volumes on German life writing, the division and reunification of Germany, as well as most recently a volume to mark the 20-year anniversary since, um, since uh, reunification in 2011. Finally, Professor Tate contributed one of the articles in this volume entitled Autobiographical Writing in the GDR Era. So I'm very pleased that he's been able to join us um, and um, I'm very happy to welcome him. Professor Tate. As the only contributor to rereading East Germany, apart from Karen, of course, taking part in today's discussion, I'm going to say a few things about my chapter on autobiographical writing in the GDR context, treating it as an example of the rereading being carried out in the volume as a whole of traditional ways of looking at East German literature. It may strike some readers of the new volume as surprising that there is no single chapter here on the novel in the GDR in the way that there are separate chapters on drama, poetry and cinema. Mine is one of three dealing with aspects of prose writing but not exclusively fiction the others being Georgina Paul's chapter on gender and Jill Twark's on satire. This thematic focusing in itself sets the volume apart from the established reading of East German literature as re represented for today's purposes by Wolfgang Emmerich's standard work on the subject, The Kleine Literaturgeschichte der DDR, published in three ever-expanding volumes between 1981 and 1996. As Emmerich is also a contributor to the present volume, providing the illuminating overview in its opening chapter, I should stress that his Kleine Literaturgeschichte remains indispensable for its comprehensive coverage and its perceptive analyses of individual works. Yet it is problematic from today's perspective, and for my subject in particular, in the way its conventional definition of the novel obscures what I see as the most distinctive feature of East German prose writing since the 1960s, the subjective turn which, that gave rise to a steady stream of self-reflexive works, many of which are located in the ambiguous narrative sphere between first-person fiction and explicit autobiography. Although Emmerich uses the more elastic term prose for the section headings in each chapter of his literary history, he still insists in his comparative analyses on differentiating between novels and what he calls factographic literature, which includes autobiography. The way he positions many narratively hybrid but thematically related works within these separate categories means that important connections and historical trends can easily be missed. When Emmerich comes in his final chapter to the flood of autobiographical works published in the aftermath of the fall of the Berlin Wall, he gives them more detailed attention than hitherto, yet the original genre demarcation is maintained. Ironically, by preserving this genre demarcation, Emmerich was also leaving unchallenged a distinction enshrined in official East German literary theory, where autobiographies and other forms of subjectivist writings were viewed with suspicion as the preferred medium of political renegades. Conventional works of fiction, which illuminated, quote, the tangled and complex interrelations between society and the individual, as Georg Lukács put it, were what East German authors were expected to produce. I argue that for an interdisciplinary appreciation of East German writing in the tradition of what Christa Wolff called subjective authenticity, the shared features of works previously shoehorned into one or other of these narrative categories need to be better understood. This applies to successive generations of authors, those like Wolff who came to prominence in the 1960s, their younger compatriots who emerged in the 1980s, and even to some extent to the rising post-GDR generation who began publishing around 2000. 
Their creative evolution follows the pattern of reworking and refining the story of their lives in a variety of narrative modes. In the course of biographies deeply marked by successive waves of historical turbulence, the crushing of the Third Reich, the division of Germany, and the various crises of East, Eastern European communism between 1949 and the fall of the Berlin Wall, East German authors have regularly needed to reconfigure early experience in the light of radically changing personal circumstances. This phenomenon is in no way unique to the work of East German authors, however. It is a feature of life writing as a whole in quite different historical and political contexts. The American scholar James Olney, in his monograph, Memory and Narrative, The Weave of Life Writing, argues on the basis of his reading of a broad range of European literature, including the early work of Christoph Wolff, that their shared obsession with getting their life stories right makes this the, quote, all-encompassing endeavor of their careers. It is this that gives their autobiographical writing its distinctive weave. In discussing Wolff's work, Olney char charts her self-confessed inability as a political co polit politically committed author to say I in the assured way she originally expected she would. He rightly sees this as symptomatic of a fragmented identity that Wolf and her contemporaries never quite managed to harmonize. What I do in my chapter in Rereading East Germany is to identify three main phases in the broad progression from optimism to disillusionment in, autobiograph in autobiographical writing over the four decades of the GDR's existence. This line of investigation is then extended later in the volume in the chapter by Alison Lewis on the impact of the revelations about the scale of Stasi surveillance on post-unification autobiography. One important conclusion I reached was that the literary crisis of disillusionment with the GDR regime begins in the late 1970s. This is traceable in work published both in the GDR and the Federal Republic through the 1980s, well before the fall of the Berlin Wall brought an end to the GDR itself. This literary anticipation of political collapse even in the work of authors who remained in the GDR to the bitter end and resisted the rapid move to German unification, merits closer examination. It exposes the superficiality of the political reading of the GDR as a state in which censorship stifled free expression to such an extent that credible autobiography could only be published after its disappearance. The literary evidence tells a more nuanced story. Thank you. As our second speaker, I'm very pleased to welcome Sarah Jones, who is Senior Birmingham Fellow in German Studies at the University of Birmingham. Her first monograph on the GDR, Complicity, Censorship and Criticism, Negotiating Space in the GDR Literary Sphere, was published in 2011, and more recently she's published The Media of Testimony, Remembering the Stasi in the Berlin Republic in 2014. This latter project looks across life writing film and museums and draws on approaches across diverse disciplines. Dr. Jones has also played an important role in encouraging comparative and interdisciplinary research into the GDR and other experiences and memories of dictatorship. She's co-edited two volumes in this area, uh, one on writing under socialism in 2011, and one on remembering dictatorship, state socialist pasts in post-socialist presence in 2014. In Birmingham, Dr. Jones has headed a number of research projects, of which the most, uh, of which the most recent will be um, an AHRC-funded research network entitled Culture and Its Uses of Testimony, an interdisciplinary investigation into testimonial and confessional forms of culture and post-conflict justice. Her own current project looks at cross-border collaborations between German memory activists. She's also been influential um, in organizing a series of conferences for postgraduates between Birmingham, Bristol, and Bangor, entitled The GDR Today. 
And I believe this work encouraging early career researchers in their continued engagement with the history and culture of East Germany will be her starting point this afternoon. Um, so I'm delighted to have her with us and um, we'll hand over to um, Dr. Jones. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much um, for that warm introduction and also for the invitation. Uh, so the first thing I want to say is how much I enjoyed uh, reading this volume of well-written, deeply interesting, and importantly, very accessible essays. Thank you. <laughs> um, so not only because it speaks so directly to the research questions um, that have preoccupied me for the last decade, um, that is GDR literature and GDR memory, um, and because I've learned a great deal, uh, but also because it so neatly fills a long-standing gap in the large number of books on this topic, um, as Tom intimated in his introduction. Uh, so what I mean by that is that in its combination of detailed and original analyses of specific texts and contexts with impressive overviews of the GDR literary field over time, it represents the first volume in English, and in many ways the first volume full stop, to make this cultural history available to undergraduate and postgraduate students. So as someone who teaches GDR history, culture and memory at various levels, this is extremely important contribution for me. And in my brief comments, I want to reflect a little on how these emerging GDR scholars approach the study of the East German state and its literature, and how this relates to the approach taken in the volume. So I think, especially for undergraduate students, um, in my experience, it seems that the draw of studying the GDR and its literature and film is often a fascination with the context, especially with the dark side, as we might say, of that context. So it's the Stasi, it's the Berlin Wall, um, the authoritarian state, censorship. However, it's also the contradictions of the East German state and its representation in memory. So, for example, I find that final year undergraduates have often met and become friends with Eastern Germans, or more likely these days, the children of Eastern Germans, on their year abroad. They've listened to the memories of a normal life lived in the dictatorship. Perhaps they've visited the collections of everyday life in the DDR Museum in Berlin, and at the same time, they have read Anna Funder's account of a deeply abnormal society in her ethnography, Stasiland. And it is always that book that they've read. Um, so this combination of what is viewed as by some as a sentimental nostalgia and by others as an assertion of an Eastern German identity with memories of repression and totalitarian control provides for lively debates in the classroom and a continued fascination for the East German state, which for these students for the most part born well after 1990, is well and truly history. So these contradictions, I think, are presented in the volume through the detailed analysis of the twists and turns of cultural policy and the twists and turns of the literary biographies of well-known authors. Despite a tendency in some chapters, I would say, to present a dichotomy, the state versus the writer, which may not always stand up to closer scrutiny, these re-readings of the literature and film of the GDR make clear that the ambivalence and ambiguity permeated the relationships between writers and power in East Germany. So intellectuals were often also part of the cultural apparatus, especially the older generation. And even where they did keep their distance, as we see so clearly in Costa Bili Hemming's chapter on the events of 1989 and 1990, many agreed with the idea of socialism, if not with its implementation in the GDR. So this ambiguity and ambivalence reveals itself to students as they engage in the study of GDR history, culture, and memory. Where they might have been drawn to the topic through a fascination with totalitarianism and the binaries that such models tend to create between victims and perpetrators and state and society, closer examination of the GDR shows something more complex. This complexity frequently motivates PhD project projects that explore increasingly diverse aspects of GDR society. So, for example, at the um, GDR Today conferences, um, which Tom mentioned, held in 2000 and 2000, uh, 2014 and 2015, papers were presented on topics ranging from, and just to give a few examples, the representation of food and food rituals in museums and film, urban development and town planning in the GDR, to the autobiographies of GDR ambassadors. Um, so... A rereading of East German literature in this regard also means revisiting the questions posed by historians and political scientists uh, in particular as to what kind of society the GDR was. Totalitarian, authoritarian, an unjust state, a dictatorship? If so, what kind? Welfare dictatorship, participatory, comfortable even. 
And now these are certainly not new questions, but neither are they ones to which we have found definitive answers. Um, nonetheless, the volume's second look at, for example, the literary underground, writers' relationships with the Stasi, and the emergence of GDR culture in the 1940s and 1950s also calls for a rethinking of the political and social context in which these intellectuals were acting. And part of these, this rethinking relates to what some have termed enthusiastically or fearfully, depending on their political position, as a historicization of the GDR. That is, locating the GDR within history, the history of the Cold War, of the 20th century, of divided Europe, of socialism, Marxism, authoritarianism, and also of European literature. Only last week, the Tageszeitung announced a new historian's debut, dispute, their term, not mine, um, when it published a book reviewed by Ilko Sasha Kovacuk, a well-known historian of the GDR based at the Office for the Stasi Files. In the review, which the academic list serve, uh, Ha Sorten Kult, had apparently refused to publish, the author lambasts the recent collection, The GDR as a Chance, published under the auspices of, a state of the state-financed foundation for the reappraisal of the GDR past. And he lambasts it for being nothing more than a reiteration of established positions by established historians keen to maintain their monopoly over research into the GDR. And it really is an astonishing book review. Um, and one of his critiques here is that only one of the authors has an East German background. Now, certainly, personal experience of a period might be an asset when writing its history. However, my experience with undergraduates and newer cohorts of postgraduates suggests there's a lack of such experience and the emotional, emotional commitment it brings, that is, an absence of Betroffenheit, might permit a cooler rereading of the East German state that also allows new connections to be made um, in the way that Dennis was also talking about. And I think the structure of the volume might provide inspiration from an established and eminent group of scholars for such connections, particularly in those chapters where GDR culture is reread not, or rather not only, in terms of its relationship to power, but also as autobiography, as poetry, as satire, as theater, as film, as an aspect of European feminism. And in this sense, there is a tension in the volume, but it is a productive tension. GDR culture is read as GDR culture, defined by the chronotope explored in the opening chapter by Wolfgang Emmerich. But it is also read as culture that extends beyond that chronotope in terms of both time and space. Indeed, the porous yet rigid borders of the GDR are identified in the chapters on poetry and the underground as significant factors in the development of an oppositional culture that ultimately contributed to the GDR's demise. And I think the contradiction of an open, closed society, epitomized by the flow of culture, surely is essential to a fuller understanding of this complex history. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, our third panelist this afternoon is uh, Professor Mark Silberman, Professor of German at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and who we have the pleasure of welcoming as a visiting professor in Oxford this term. Um, Professor Silverman's own doctoral dissertation, published in 1976 as The Literature of the Working World, a study of the industrial novel in East Germany, um, was one of the first in, uh, was one of the first works in English at all on GDR culture at that time. And since that monograph, he's published widely on the GDR, including a 1980 volume on Heiner Müller, and his works in the late 1990s um, on uh, post-reunification reassessments of the importance of GDR culture, including a volume uh, in 1997 uh, provocatively entitled What Remains, um, and another one a year later entitled Contentious Memories. In the last five years or so, he's um, been influential in analyzing GDR society and culture in light of the so-called spatial turn. Uh, uh, Sarah mentioned borders in her um, in her. Um, paper, and, um, and Mark has also contributed to a number, of, uh, a number of discussions of this spatial feature of um, the GDR culture. Uh, one book entitled Walls, Borders, and Boundaries, for example, uh, co-edited with Karen Till and Janet Ward in 2012. His more recent research has been influential in bringing a comparative and interdisciplinary perspective to the study of GDR cinema, including the volume Defa at the Crossroads of East German and International Film Culture co-edited with Henning Vrage in 2014. 
Earlier this month, uh, he organized an interdisciplinary workshop in Madison called New Research on East Germany, of which the proceedings will be published next year in the journal Imaginations. And so it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Mark, and um, thank you very much for joining us. And... Thank you, Tom, and thank you for inviting me, Karen, to participate in this panel. So um, the title of this book is something that I really like, Rereading East Germany. I think it places an appropriate emphasis on the process of interpretation, which is something that we as literary scholars and cultural historians have to be involved in, and we are involved in that. And I think Karen's essay in the volume, the final essay of the volume, chapter 12, a substantive and copiously footnoted essay, in my view, also the highlight of the entire anthology, insists precisely on the challenge of realizing this process. That is, the need to maintain an openness to various approaches and methodologies in treating the GDR and its afterlife. The volume as a whole, as the, the prior speakers have mentioned, brings together an impressive group of seasoned GDR specialists who write with authority and insight about their areas of expertise. I do, however, have a quibble with the subtitle, The Literature and Film of the GDR. I think it's misleading, and I think it even misrepresents what the collection does achieve. That is an overview of some of the major issues that have concerned GDR specialists mm -hmm. since 1990. The definite article, the, raises questions. The literature of the GDR. As Karen notes in her own essay, the literature discussed is almost entirely focused on prose selections. And she tries, in fact, to counteract this imbalance by bringing in some poetry. But drama, in contrast to the one essay on theater stagings in Berlin, is pretty much ignored throughout the volume. And more generally, the selection of texts that do receive exemplary treatment remains tied to a canon that was established prior to 1990. We've heard about Wolfgang Emmerich's three versions of Die kleine Literaturgeschichte. Um, these remain tied to a canon, at least in the first nine chapters of the book that focus on writing in the GDR. The reference to film in the subtitle is even more misleading. Only one chapter treats GDR cinema, and it is narrowly focused on the familiar tradition of anti-fascist feature films produced by DEFA between 1946 and 1974. Even the book's bibliography, which is divided helpfully into sections that track the essays, treats only anti-fascism and DEFA as the selection of uh, East German cinema. This despite the fact that the DEFA company, the state-owned company, has a much richer history than indicated here, one that included several different production studios located in various GDR cities, producing documentaries, children's films, animated films, TV films, and so on and so forth. A second point. When I began reading the book, I was struck by a statement in Karen's introduction. I quote her. Astonishingly, no single volume has been published in English that attempts to come to terms with the GDR as a cultural phenomenon. Today, some 25 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, that absence is even more striking, end quote. I thought to myself, this can't be true. There are, in fact, works in German, but indeed there is nothing similar in English. And I was surprised somehow in my reading of GDR stuff, I don't distinguish so much which language I'm reading in, I guess. There have indeed been significant Anglophone works on GDR history, on the contemporary Berlin Republic and the difficulties of unification, on various aspects of GDR cultural history, some of them written by the contributors to this very volume we're looking at today. At the same time, I think this anthology is limited generally by its commemorative approach. That is, as mentioned in the introductory acknowledgments, and as Tom mentioned, the contradictions were uh, the contributions, excuse me, were originally presented at a March 2011 symposium that Karen organized at New College, and in many respects, that symposium was a summation of the 20-year commemoration of the fall of the Berlin Wall in November 2009. 
Conference proceedings always tend to yield a mixed bag of contributions. I have a lot of experience with this. And that is the case here, too, in this volume, I think. Tracking the footnotes of some of the authors reveals that their research does not extend much beyond 2008. And while many of the authors acknowledge the additional commemorative look back on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the fall of the wall in 2014, in fact, only Karen's final essay really makes an effort to demonstrate the process of memory work that has indeed been engaged in in just the past five years. And this only confirms my own hypothesis that the dynamic process of coming to terms with the GDR past is an ongoing project, one that delivers less in terms of conclusions than in formulating strategies for thinking about issues and how we confront them. In other words, as GDR literature and film, or GDR culture more generally, are slipping away into history, I am concerned that we, in fact, seem to be narrowing down our perspective of what constituted them. And let me elab elaborate in this, uh, this in my third comment about some patterns I see in this book, both recycled approaches as well as new openings. Most of the contributions resort to a familiar pre-1990 view of GDR literature characterized by generations and decades. Some of the authors define two, some three, one, even four generations of writers in the GDR's short 40-year history, and then further dissect the generational experiences into decades, usually by political events. 1949, the establishment of the two German states, 1961, the building of the Berlin Wall, 1971, the change in regime, 1979, the great exit of many um, prominent literary and cultural figures. Generations and decades are legitimate approaches to the writing of literary history. But these historiographical markers are heuristic devices or even crutches that inevitably invite second thoughts about continuities and slippages. And we are at a point now where this should be the case when organizing our thoughts about GDR culture. On the other hand, I do note some refreshing new points of departure in these essays, in some of these essays. First of all, there's an awareness of a need to recognize variant temporalities when treating GDR literature and writers. Their desire to rule over time, the need to escape from time, from present time, the realization of Ungleichzeitigkeiten, that's Ernst Bloch's notion of non-synchroneity, and I think, Tom, that's what you meant in your introductory remarks with simultaneities. Wolfgang Emmerich, whose uh, first essay in the volume has been mentioned a number of times, despite his characterization of GDR culture as, I quote, a 40-year period of structural unchangingness, introduces Bakhtin's chronotype as a means of defining the particularity of writers' experiences and memories, a time-space structure of perception that is not simply determined by political events and geopolitics. Or Dennis Tate's chapter, chapter five in the volume, introduces some examples of fine-grained analysis of individual writers' personal experience, emphasizing aspects of temporality, such as the duration of an individual's life and the changing circumstances of the writing process over time. And in her final essay, Karen emphasizes both the temporal and geographical axes of how we assess the GDR. I believe we need to acknowledge different spaces with their own temporalities for thinking about the GDR, which suggests a second new point of departure I find in this volume. Several of the book's essays focus on the experience of, uh, of the, on the everyday experience of writers or of the conflicts negotiated in their texts, and the word Alltagsgeschichte comes up in several of the essays to characterize this. Karen, for example, stresses the importance of individual memory as distinguished from the questions and conclusions that historians identify. This strikes me as a challenge that we as historians of literature and culture need to push now into the foreground. 
We need a consistent effort to account for everyday lived experience, and that will help us recognize the distinctions we need to draw between ideals and reality, or between the society's center and its margins, the latter being the space where traditionally literature finds its material and inspiration. Jan Behrens's chapter on poetry, chapter eight, does this in exemplary fashion by focusing on the multiplicity of literary voices, the hybridity of GDR poems, and the mobility of the poets themselves. One final point. I think we need to question the fetish of power that characterizes almost all writing about the GDR, including most of the essays in this book. We don't need Foucault to explain how power functions. It's like gravity. It's inescapable and in itself not conducive to helping us ask new and interesting questions. Alison Lewis's discussion of the Stasi and literary writing, chapter 10 in the book, makes this point. Downplaying the concern with totalitarianism in an attempt that focuses on the writer's engagement with society and the daily intersubjective exercise of power. She does a good job of demonstrating how post-1990 literary autobiographics, as she calls it, in which authors have written about and traced uh, uh, written about and reacted to their Stasi files create effects of layering and overwriting that can mobilize and empower the readers. When we sink down to this local level of analysis, to how a text actually functions, power issues, while everywhere and ever present, are no longer distinct as such, but rather a background noise against which other topics take on shape. I would have other things to say, but my time is up, so I will take my seat, and I want to hear from Karen. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mark, for that very interesting um, and very provocative contribution. Um, uh, uh, so it's my, it's my pleasure now to introduce Karen Leader, who edited the uh, volume. Karen is Professor of Modern German Literature here in Oxford and Fellow and Tutor at New College. Um, and she's published widely on GDR literature, including um, her uh, monograph, Breaking Boundaries, back in 1996, which was the first substantial work in any language to deal with the poetry of the 1980s in the GDR, sparking widespread interest in this area. Um, she's continued to publish um, uh, a large number of very influential um, uh, volumes on GDR literature and culture, including a volume of Oxford German Studies in 2009, uh, entitled From Stasiland to Ostalgie, um, a uh, contrast that we've already heard mentioned a couple of times, um, uh, an edited volume on Brecht in the GDR, and um, a companion to Durst Grünbein. Um, she also works with German poets, particularly those from the GDR, on translations of their works into English, including a volume of contemporary poems after Brecht in 2006, and more recently, prize-winning translations of, uh, of the recent poems of poets such as Volker Braun, Jos Grünbein, and the younger contemporary poet, Ulrike Amundsandich, who I mentioned earlier. Her current project is a monograph due for publication next year entitled Spectres of the GDR, uh, and it's this theme that she picks up on in her concluding contribution, which uh, Mark mentioned. Uh, and so I'm very excited to hear her thoughts on the volume and on the, co uh, the, um, the contributions that, um, that our panelists have made. So I'll stop talking and hand over. Karen, thank you. Um, uh, and thank you for everybody for the comments. Um, I feel like I should start writing the book now. Now I know what it should be about. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I'm going to keep my comments brief because I, I think it would be good to have uh, some discussion. Um, uh, I started um, the volume with uh, Stefan Heim's fav fav uh, famous comment on March 18th of March 1990. Um, talking about the, the, uh, the GDR being a footnote, no more than a footnote in world history. And uh, Timothy Garth Nash's rejoinder that if it's a footnote, it's the longest, best documented and most interesting footnote in history. Um, th this provoked me um, at a personal level. You know, if it's a footnote, have I invested 20 years of my academic <laughs> career in thinking about it? Um, uh, um, but all, and I'll come back to that about our critical investment as, as critics as well, and personal investment. Um, but also, as, as Mark um, said, because in sort of 20 years of uh, teaching the GDR, I realized there was no book in English. Now, that's absolutely right. There were, there were huge and wonderful books in German, um, but the students couldn't read those anymore. Uh, and so it, it seemed very important to have a volume in English 
also to affirm the, the importance, and I do believe in this, of um, uh, studies from outside the country, so outside the particular context in which something is happening and the kind of insights that one can get. Um, and so sort of 1990, when I started thinking about this, um, was a moment which you have to remember that uh, people's lives and a whole culture was being dumped in a skip, literally dumped in a skip. So libraries were taken out and dumped in a skip. Um, or shredded. Um, and at the same time, of course, was the beginning of the kind of retro fetishization, the kind of retro chic of the little green and red um, uh, traffic light men that you can buy now. Um, so the kind of commodification of a memory of the GDR or the beginnings of kind of Stasi world and stuff and so on. Um, more seriously, alongside that was a boom in GDR studies. Um, with new authors being very quickly translated, and even a generation of young authors coming to prominence who were children when the Berlin Wall fell, but grew up still identifying themselves as kind of born in the GDR. Um, under the, they were called Zornenkinder, um, that's the title of Jana Hensel's book that uh, sort of documented that experience, that first experience, rather piously translated as experiences of an East German childhood in English, but actually it's sort of kids of the zone. Um, uh, and at the same time then, there were these films. Um, Wolfgang Becker's Goodbye Lenin, 2003. Uh, Florian Henkel von Donnersmark's uh, The Lives of Others, of course. So there was a kind of boom in interest in the GDR at the same time over the sort of decade as it was being dismissed and forgotten, actually, um, in certain quarters. Um, so the volume came out of a, a desire to... Um, to have a look at that uh, sort of double perspective, um, but also very consciously about the, the kind of blind spot of writing about the contemporary. I mean, I tend to write about the contemporary very often. Um, and there's something a bit strange about that. The Wender Zeit very quickly became a Zeiten Wender, so a turning point, a turning of times. Time speeded up and changed very fast. Um, and it's very difficult, I think, to, to, there's a sort of blind spot. It's a bit like trying to look at yourself and sort of running away from a mirror like children do and see yourself in it. Um, what is the truth of our moment? Uh, and 25 years on seemed a kind of suitable distance, actually, where you might be able to see um, certain things more clearly without the uh, kind of uh, partisanship operating at the time uh, that the GDR existed. Um, but also... Um, uh, it was allowed a chance to think about the reading that Mark mentioned, uh, successive layers of paradigms of reading and what had happened um, and how this, this country, this state, had been read. Um, now, I mean, it engaged, so that the, the idea was to engage in lots of big questions. Um, when, when I uh, started thinking about this, and many people, including some writers from the GDR, thought of anything that came out of a repressive regime as tainted, somehow. Uh, Doris Grunbein, who's already been mentioned, has brought out a book this year called The Years in the Zoo, um, talking about his own childhood in the GDR, and spoke of his East German writing as poetry from the bad side. Um, and particularly among historians, there is an allied argument that in an unjust state, an Unrechtstaat, um, there can be no justice. Um, and so there's a sort of tendency to see the individual phenomena from the GDR as part and parcel of the whole thing and to therefore relegate, relegate it from, from value. And this is compounded by this kind of sharpened interest in the secret police, it seemed to me. Um, uh, I, in the underground, for example, where I, where I worked for some time, um, one in three people were reporting on their colleagues. It was the densest, most densely observed part of, of the GDR culture. Um, and during the filming of The Lives of Others, the uh, lead actor famously discovered that his own wife had been informing on him. So there's a sort of story within a story um, in that. Um, but one can go further, I speak, um, I think, and, and uh, be interested in the defamation of culture in a place where it is forced to become a replacement for the functions that a free press and a political system would have in the West. So Chernobyl, for example, which we just uh, marked the commemoration of, 1986, uh, Christoph Wallace's work about this was one of the, you know, it was a work about that because it couldn't be talked about, uh, in a sense, in the political um, culture. Um, there's a tendency also, so perhaps deformed the culture from the GDR, um, but there's a tendency also to, to sort of think of it on a different scale, good for the GDR, 
uh, you know, a work is good for the GDR. We have a, a phrase at home, stylish for Sheffield, but I'm allowed to say that because um, <laughs> my husband comes from there. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, good for the... So this idea that this work is good, yeah, but within the limitations which, um, which, which pervaded. And I'm hoping, again, that, that the distance will allow us to sort of say, well, actually, some of the things really don't stand up anymore. Actually... Um, our ways of reading highlighted them then, but they, they don't stand up anymore. Um, and other things might come to uh, prominence. Um, to my mind, two authors, two other authors of world significance came out of the state, and that's Brecht and Heine Müller. Uh, and others who I think have been a canonical, you know, at the centre of canons perhaps, um, fade, fade away. Um, and this is important about the way we read, and uh, I'm so pleased, Mark, that you picked up this idea of reading because that's so important to me. Um, the other thing I completed this year was called figuring lateness, and I realised that I'm, that's, that's all I'm interested in, actually, reading and figuring. Um, um, because, you know, we, there was this idea of the dissident bonus in the GDR, so that something could be good simply by being critical, um, and that has to be unpicked as well, so uh, to see to see um, what happens. Uh, and David Bathrick has pointed out our own kind of complicity in that, um, the sort of strange libidinal attachment of uh, also uh, West, uh, Western intellectuals to the GDR as a potential purveyor of post-capitalist alternatives, as a preservation reserve for the idea of the non-capitalist utopia. Um, so it comes to a question of how we read, and, and I was so pleased to have the opportunity to reread this, actually, which I probably wouldn't have done. <laughs> and I thought, so what's come out of it? And, and I just want to finish with um, some of the things that's been said. Um, I think Mark's right. Um, perhaps there's too much on the novel. It was always one of my intentions to move away from the dominance of the novel um, and to introduce poetry and photography and film. Uh, and art, and I would have had a chapter on music and food um, preparation if, I, if CUP had allowed me as well, uh, Sarah, but, um, but perhaps we haven't gone far enough, and, and perhaps that's the future for, for future um, scholars. Um, I suppose um, the other sort of couple of things, I sort of had about four conclusions um, to, to draw. Um, I, I think generations, which has already been mentioned, is a key one. Um, in a country of revolutions, or failed revolutions, to be more precise, Germany is very wedded to the idea of the paradigm of generational um, uh, interpretation. And I think that now uh, the historian Tony Judd has talked about simply the post-war. And now I think we're in the post-post-war. And we're looking forward not only to the historicization of the GDR, but the normalization of thinking about... Uh, generations, which allows different uh, sort of ideas. I became very uh, conscious also of the curious phenomenon and the images there. For that, this is an image from an uh, October film, Dresden, 1989, about the way that the GDR is simultaneously, curiously far away. I mean, look at that picture. It could be from, this is 1989. Mm -hmm. That could be from the 1950s, you know, couldn't it? Um, and yet, very clear in that people are alive who lived it, and I remember it. And we all, so there's a very curious bifocal aspect to what's happening in the GDR, which I'm hoping to explore in the book about ghosts. And finally, um, and I'm very grateful to my colleagues who pointed this out to me. I, I sort of did it instinctively without realising, I think. It seemed to me very important that what this preservation reserve is opened up to new critical paradigms um, so that um, sovereignty studies, the topographical term, the post-human, feminism, gender, um, uh, and it's only really in this way that the footnote of the GDR will survive if it becomes amenable to the analysis um, of the present. So thank you very much indeed, everybody, for your insights. Thank you.